Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we continue to look at the Delphi case and the recent arrest of a man named Richard M. Allen, 50 years old, living in Delphi, Indiana, all this time, very close to Monon High Bridge, to one of the victims' families' homes, of course, to the town as well, and working at the only pharmacy in town, the CVS. What we're going to do today is look at some legal stuff. Disclaimer, I am by no means a legal professional, so not a lawyer, not a detective. I'm just going to be showing you some clips like the one that I have ready for you here, where we're going to look at the judge in this case asking for help. We're going to look at some of Superintendent Doug Carter's latest interviews where he mentions that he's received many more tips since the arrest of Richard Allen, which I think is really great. I think he said about 200 tips, which is really great because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of information still coming out about this man. And then we're going to be looking at the charges which are now publicly available to be seen. The documents know the probable cause is still sealed and there is a hearing uh, which will be happening on the 22nd of November this year, 2022, where the judge will decide if he's going to keep those documents sealed or what to release or not. That is what he's asking for help with. So we'll look at that, uh, Richard Allen's charges, and then look at the exact code. What do those charges really mean? So let's break it all down and let's start with this clip right here the case against the man who now is accused of killing Abby Williams and Libby German in Delphi. This entire case against Richard Allen is sealed, but 13 News has been fighting to find out how and why those details are being kept secret. Our senior investigative reporter Bob Siegel joins us live tonight at 6. So, Bob, some of these records are now made public. And I'm showing this clip because Bob explained it so well. And of course, everybody wants to know why are these documents sealed? Because normally documents like this would be public. Yes, Scott, this is the email investigators sent directly to the judge, the prosecutor and the state court administrators to get more answers about the arrest of Richard Allen. Just hours after we sent this email, the court decided some of the information being kept secret should be publicly released. We now know court records show Allen's initial bond was set at $20 million. We have an online case summary showing past and upcoming court dates. And we'll have a look at that um, after this clip. We have a case number so the public can now follow details and events in the case. Judge Benjamin Dean are granted a request by 13 News to release all those details. And following our questions, the court also posted this notice, setting a date for a public hearing for the judge to determine whether important records in the case will remain under seal. All of that now appears on the state's public court website where anyone can see it instead of being hidden like it has been for the past six days since charges were first filed. What we still do not have is the detailed probable cause affidavit, which details why police believe Allen is responsible for the deaths of the two Delphi girls. That and that's going to be really interesting because there is still the speculation out there that he may not have acted alone. And when we deep dive the charges that he is facing with no bond, we initially had the $20 million bond, uh, we are going to see what that all means. That is supposed to be public and it's still being kept under seal. That will be the focus of the public hearing coming up on November 22nd. The judge says keeping that important document under seal has created a difficult situation for the court. Today, Judge Diener copied 13 News on an email to state court administrators. He wrote, just so the world knows, the Carroll Circuit Court consists of me, Benjamin A. Diener, the judge. My court reporter was hired Friday and began Monday. My bailiff answers the phone, has no experience and no knowledge about legal process. Thankfully, there is a court administrator that has experience, but she has duties regarding Carroll Circuit. Damn, <laughs> that sounds so stressful and not what one might expect. I suppose in a small town you would, but uh, wow, the judge is asking for help here based on being surrounded by inexperienced people? It and Carol's superior courts. That is it. So I am begging for some assistance to shield me, the court, from this storm so that I, the court, can keep running the court. 
The state court administration is providing guidance to the judge on how to handle all the questions. 13 News is continuing to push for the probable cause affidavit because by state law it is considered a public document. Still lots of information we don't know. For example, bail originally set at $20 million. Now, the, uh, just a few days ago, the prosecutor said there is no bail. It could be three more weeks before we learn more details, including what evidence police uncovered to link Richard Allen to the Delphi murders. Let me know what you guys think about that, about the judge saying, please help me, shield me from the storm. I see people have already been sending me this clip and sharing the opinion, so feel free to comment below what you think about that. Okay, now we're looking at the public courts link over here, searching for the state of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen. You can see the case number listed there, Carroll uh, Circuit Court, MR, it says type MR murder, filed on the 28th of the 10th. So I know you guys in America, you're at 10, 28, 2022. Uh, if you didn't know, in South Africa, ne the Netherlands and the UK, we would write day, month, and then year. So that's why I said that way around, so that I also know what day was that. So the 28th of October, 2022, and the status is pending, in brackets they say active. Parties to the case, Richard M. Allen is the defendant, the plaintiff, state of Indiana. Now, if you look there, um, it says the charges, right? It says 13, so 0 2 13, 2017. You can see the dates of which this occurred, which makes sense. That is the date. And so you can see over there the charges are 35-42-1-1 in parentheses 2, murder and you could see it listed twice so some of you were commenting on my short saying maybe the parentheses two means two counts no but it's one count two count and the charge is under that indiana state code which we're going to look at i just first want to quickly go through this page with you then we're going to look into that code and exactly what that means so on the 28th of october the case was opened as a new filing and then there was a petition filed verified request to prohibit public access to a court record filed. So that's what this hearing is going to be about to unseal some of these documents, right? So also on the 28th of October, order issued court order sealing request and court records pending public hearing. And Benjamin A. Diener is the judicial officer, the judge, and the lead prosecutor is Nicholas Charles McClelland, who we saw at the press conference. If you remember, he was the third speaker. It was Superintendent Doug Carter, and then the Sheriff Tobe Blesenby, and then Nicholas McClelland, who spoke at the press conference. If you missed it, go check it out. I'll link everything below for you. So then they say information filed count one. This was on the 28th of October as well. Count one, murder, filed by the state of Indiana and then count two, murder. And then they say probable cause affidavit filed. That was on, this is 2801, that's a typo. Okay, uh, 2810, 2022. You could see it on the other side. And then the order issued says court finds that probable cause does exist. The court sets the bond in the sum of $20 million cash or corporate surety. Initial hearing is set for October 28th, 2022 at 10.30 a.m. per form. So that already happened. And then order on initial hearing, order issued, we keep going. And then it says here all the different hearings that are scheduled. So you can see the one there is on the 22nd of November, 2022, and that is at 9 a.m. So you could see everything else here. You could see the pre-trial conference is on the 13th of January, 2023 at 9am. And the trial is set to start jury trial on the 20th of March, 2023. Just for interest sake, for those of you who do wonder, Kegan Klein's pre-trial hearing is on the 22nd of December, 2022. And his trial starts on the 18th of January, 2023. Okay, so that's everything that we can see there. And then if we look at the actual document, which was shared on Twitter by Angela Ganode, it says State of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen. There's the case number and everything. Order acknowledging public hearing. A public hearing will be conducted pursuant to Indiana Code 
514.35.5 and Indiana Rules of Court, Rules on Access to Court Records, Rule 6, November 22nd, 2022 at 9 a.m. in the Carroll Circuit Court. Parties or members of the general public will be permitted to testify and submit written briefs subject to reasonable time constraints imposed by the court. A decision to seal all or part of a public record must be based on findings of fact and conclusions of law, showing that the remedial benefits to be gained by effectuating the public policy of the state declared in Section 1 of this chapter are outweighed by proof by a preponderance of the evidence by the person seeking the sealing of the record that 1. A public interest will be secured by sealing the record. 2. Dissemination of the information contained in the record will create a serious and imminent danger to that public interest. 3. Any prejudicial effect caused by dissemination of the information can be avoided by any reasonable method other than sealing the record. 4. There is a substantial probability that sealing the record will be effective in protecting the public interest against the perceived danger. And 5. It is reasonably necessary for the record to remain sealed for a period of time. Sealed records shall be unsealed at the earliest possible time after the circumstances necessitating the sealing of the records no longer exist. So ordered on the second day of November 2022. You could see there Benjamin A. Diener, judge signed over there, attorney Nicholas McClelland. Okay, so if we go back to this, these charges over here, the 3542 1 1 in parentheses 2, there's two counts of this for murder. And, and now we go to the Indiana General Assembly site here where they explain or list the charges. And you can see here it says Indiana Code IC 3542 1 1. And then remember in parentheses it was 2. So this is all under the category of murder. Now, they say a person who, if it was parentheses one, knowingly or intentionally kills another human being. But that's not what this one is. This one was 3542 1-1 in parentheses two. So they say, and a lot of these words I'm not going to be able to say out loud, so I'm really hoping that you'll read along with me. This is because of YouTube's rules and them wanting to keep everything kind of family friendly, which is very hard to do in true crime. And if you don't do that, then it limits the reach of the video. So I don't want that to happen, which is why I then, you know, try to censor it in some way. So two, kills another human being while committing or attempting to commit arson, burglary, child M, consumer product tampering, criminal deviant conduct under IC 3542-42 before its repeal, kidnapping, SA, robbery, human T, promotion of human labor T, promotion of human ST, promotion of child ST, promotion of ST of a younger child, child ST, or carjacking before its repeal. Now, in listening to the Murder Sheet podcast's latest three episodes, there was one of theirs which was an update on Richard Allen, in which they, with legal experience, broke this all down. So I took notes, and I'm going to read those to you because they explain exactly what that means. So they say, it's essentially a felony murder, so they don't have to prove under this charge that Richard M. Allen willfully took the lives of Abby and Libby. They need to prove that he participated in one of the crimes mentioned under that statute that ultimately resulted in the death of the victims. So all of those things that we just read through, the court we need to prove that he participated in any one or more of those activities and that because of that or as a result of that the girls lost their lives under that statute he doesn't even have to have personally killed the girls or be aware that that was the plan all they need to prove is that he was a willing participant in one of the felonies listed that resulted in the death 
of these two girls. This could mean either one that he did not intentionally, as number one, the parenthesis, he didn't knowingly or intentionally kill them. But then again, based on that uh, Ron Logan search warrant, the way they described some of the crime scene, we still don't know all the details, but what they said, I don't know if that would apply. So the second option then would be that somebody else was involved, two or more people, including, of course, Richard M. Allen. So that's, that's what that all means, which is interesting to consider. It's not just um, two counts of murder with the parentheses of one knowingly or intentionally kills another human being. It's in doing some other act, as listed in all those options, that then resulted in the murder of the victims. Again, if you have legal experience and you want to comment on what I just said there and what I had found out here from listening to the Murder Sheet podcast and how they broke it down, please email me, grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. Legal experience is always very, very helpful to a true crimer, to a true crime YouTuber. So I would really appreciate your feedback. So just to recap, there's going to be a hearing on the 22nd of November 2022 where the judge will decide if this probable cause document, if that will be sealed or unsealed, you know, will it remain sealed or is it going to be unsealed? And whatever other documents are associated with this case, then there's a pre-trial conference on the 13th of January, 2023. And then there's also a jury trial, which will then begin on the 20th of March, 2023. One comment I can make is, don't you think that Richard Allen was quite overconfident that he would never get caught because of all the stuff that they were able to find in his flower bed and shed and home, possibly, carrying out a shoebox and a stack of books, a Macy's bag, uh, dark uh, cloth. It's just to think that for all these years, he kept whatever that is, whatever it may be. You know, I don't know if it would be logs from like a list of clients who want the type of photographs that he would speculatively have or if he actually kept trophies from the crimes that he has committed, of which he's now been charged with two counts of murder. Can you imagine if he just kept all that in the shed or in his garden? Like that, he really was overconfident that he would never be caught. So it is still amazing. And it's still fascinating to think, how did they catch him? How did they finally get then his DNA? Or who tipped them off? what really happened here? As Dakota said, he can't wait to tell us all the story one day. I know, believe me, I can't wait to hear it. Okay, so let's listen to this little interview clip from Superintendent Dakota being interviewed by Fox 59 in the last 24 hours or so, depending on when you're watching this. I can't imagine what those little girls felt. And it haunts me. It haunts me to this day. That haunting is what Superintendent Carter says drove him and his investigators for the past five and a half years. He called this the most complex case he's ever seen. We were going to be very methodical, we're going to be very purposeful, and we're going to be very direct in everything that we do. While it's been an emotional few days, Carter says the one thing he hasn't processed yet is that the man they've arrested was living in Delphi the entire time. We asked him if there are any regrets. I mean, it's textbook, right, that he was living in hiding in plain sight. So as much as uh, Doug Carter says, it's like amazing that he is living in plain sight, as they had said, it's also kind of expected, right? Even though it's such a small community, they had said all along, he's hiding in plain sight, part of the community, and they urged people to please look out for his walk, his clothing, everything about him, and to call in those tips. Anybody that... that Um, looks back on their life and doesn't have some regrets, probably is not being truthful. Of course we do. But one thing I can guarantee you, everything we did, we, we did with a purpose. And I will defend them until my final day. When we asked about his confidence in their case against Allen, Carter doubled down. Once a judge signs that, that probable cause affidavit, it changes everything. And the judge wouldn't have signed off on that probable cause if we didn't have probable cause. With more than 70,000 tips and mountains of evidence, despite an arrest, Carter says the work is just now starting. Well, I've never been a homicide detective. I have a pretty good idea that these detectives are going to reset. 
and um, th they're not going to leave a piece of paper unattended. Even though... Oh man, imagine all the things that they're still going to uncover about this man. Though the case against Allen remains sealed, Carter says he believes people will understand once it eventually becomes public. His wish going forward is that everyone remembers the human aspect of this terrible ordeal. I really hope that people will take a step back from this and, and, and understand the value of every day. Mike and Becky and Anna and Kelsey and the rest of the Delphi community deserve that. Carter says he is most proud of his team, the work they've done and the sacrifices they've made. As far as criticism of them goes, he says he hopes it continues because it only makes them better. And he's always said that actually Doug Carter's always like, if you want to criticize anybody, me, criticize me. So he's like, take one for the team, right? Okay, so this is a longer interview with Fox 59. It's about uh, five and a half minutes or so that I'm going to show you here. So let's have a look at this one. Superintendent Carter here now on the red couch. I want to start with taking us to the day when you knew you had the evidence and you mm. could actually not announce it, but that you could make the arrest. It, what was that day you know, like? First of all, thank you for welcoming me here. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was surreal and I, I was uh, not for us. I was so excited about the family. To be able to talk with the family and to and enter the community and maybe mm -hmm. even maybe now this is going to start that process of healing that would be my hope yeah congratulations i knew that um you know many of us thought that you would retire you know at a certain time and then we knew that you probably wouldn't um because of how important this case was i mean every case is important it is. um and i know that because i know you but can you dive into that um this community was rocked. The country was in a different way, perhaps, because mm -hmm. of the innocence of, of two eighth graders. I've said all along, it's every, every town USA. Yeah. And I think that's the dynamic of how this has grown and how it's gained such momentum, Angela. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to I'm going to pause every now and then because that is how fair use works. So for those of you who complain about it, please go check out the Fox 59 clip yourself without me interrupting and leaving my commentary. I still think it is such a horrifying crime in broad daylight on a Monday, February 13th, 2017, a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old girl standing on a bridge. The bridge is already scary and they just crossed that bridge. That was a big moment for Abby. I don't believe, according to Kelsey, that she'd crossed the bridge before. So that was like she conquered something and then this predator comes across that bridge and does the absolute unthinkable. It is horrendous. See it to see it now, and to see maybe that community that's mm -hmm. become so special to me and to all of us mm -hmm. um, start that process of getting back to some semblance of normalcy. Of normalcy, it it, it, um, it warmed my heart, mm -hmm. quite, quite frankly. You work so closely with your team. Um, all of the the state um, troopers, the the detectives, the, the the prosecutor's office, the U.S. Marshals, the sheriff's department. When it came to saying, "Okay, now we have this. We know this is going to get out. How how do we do it?" And we are only going to say his name, and we're going to give the mugshot. Right. How how does that discussion look? Is it an easy yeah. discussion? Do you debate it? How does that even come yeah. together? Well, the d debate's good for everything, Absolutely. right? So there's a lot of there was a, there certainly was a lot of debate with with strategy throughout this entire yeah. process, but the, I I felt enormous responsibility, mm -hmm. but not near the responsibility that those frontline detectives felt. Mm -hmm. So my job was to support them in everything that they did, not question them, mm. but to support them. Yeah. And and I, I I hope that I did that. Um, I, I know I did it to the best of my ability. The strategy with release, mm -hmm. um, we've always realized the best way through trouble is right up the middle. Mm. So um, we're going to do what we always think is right. Mm. Not necessarily what people want to hear, mm -hmm. but we're, gonna, we're going to do what, what we believe is right. And gosh, we well, I'm just going to quickly say there is, of course, they only get one shot at prosecuting this guy, which is why a lot of times, of course, in almost every case they play it so so carefully if there's any risk of whatever's in that probable cause affidavit that could tip off as they said anyone else that may be involved they don't want to do that 
they need to hold find those people and hold them accountable too before things like that can be released but let's see what happens especially after november 22nd we look back on our whole lifetime and yeah. we have dang i wish i had done that differently but yeah. i don't think i was doing it knowing it was wrong so yeah. Yeah. it's been, that that's what we did yeah. probable cause um, this has become, wow, this really blew up actually on my Facebook page. I was surprised that I have like a thousand people and about half of them are angry. It is very, it is very rare that a probable cause would be sealed right. and we wouldn't have even something that showed a little information, redacted everything, but something just said, we have evidence here. Here's how this looks. To have it all under seal, very rare. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually a little surprised that people were um, upset at us that we would at least request that the judge look at it and say, okay, is this really how this should be mm -hmm. and it should be under seal? You Isn't it strange how people are either really angry right now that it's not publicly available or they're really angry <laughs> that the media is asking for it to be unsealed? Which kind of angry are you? If you're angry right now about either of those options, which one is it? I don't feel angry. I feel patient. And patience is not my strong point. But if this trial happens in March of 2023, do you know how much information we're going to learn then? I don't think it will be televised, but we don't know that yet. From something I read there in that summary, uh, already from just his first court hearing, that wasn't uh, televised. So I'm not sure if this trial will be but can you imagine the updates from every day or even the updates after the trial? Oh, my word. After five years and eight months, they arrested a man that law enforcement um, and everyone's referring to as bridge guy. Some people get really angry about that, too, saying we shouldn't be calling him bridge guy just yet. Let me know as well what you think about that. Is this bridge guy? I mean, that is what they were saying at the press conference. So, to me, they called Bridge Guy. But let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd be very interested to read what you think. And if you're angry about it, about people saying Bridge Guy. You understand that that is our job, and you would, I'm guessing, expect us to I would. request that. I, I would, and I do. I, um, you know, I, I think that, that you guys do a really good job of, of maintaining that stability in the middle someplace. Yeah. And uh, th th this is rather unusual. Yeah. But it's not going to be forever. Yeah. This is very complex. And just since, um, what, less than 48 hours ago, we have over 200 new additional tips. And there it is. 200 new additional tips. Ooh, I can't imagine what all those tips are about. You know what I mean? Like, what are they saying about Richard M. Allen? What do people know about him? Who else encountered him and in what way? It's going to be so interesting. So uh, we've, still got, we've still got a lot of work to do. But I'm proud of where we are. Can you characterize any of those tips if you could say, well, it's kind of what we have gotten or like, whoa, we've gotten something. I mean, I know you can't talk specifics. No, I'll say, that every, yeah. I'll say to you, to, to, the, to, to everybody yeah. watching this morning, every one of those matter. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them matters. So if you think it's a little bit unusual, let us, tell us, let mm -hmm. us figure that out. Now, we're not always going to tell you what we know yeah. um, until the time is right. We'll never tell you what we think. Mm -mm. So that's kind of where this is right now. Well, you know, I mean, I, I want to ask you a thousand questions, but I know that we have an, you know, we have a relationship and I know not to step over that because I do respect you. I trust you. I know you've worked hard. You were a man of character when you said we have an arrest. We will let everyone know. You were a man of your integrity. You, you, you gave us that and we appreciate that and we've always enjoyed working with you. I and we congratulate well, you. Well, and I, I, you know, the congratulations, congratulations are, you know, kind of a side note to all this. But, I but it's important. It is. I appreciate that. It really goes to the people that have done all this work. It's been just an, just an amazing experience of, of humility and of, of partnerships with the Sheriff's Office and the City PD and all of our federal partnerships. And that's cliche sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's, gosh, yeah. it's so real now. It's so real now. And, and we're not done yet. No, and especially when you look at, I mean, it's my daughters are, the, they would have been my daughter's age. They should be in college. Yeah. And it's disgusting and it's sad. It so I think for us to be able to, as a community, be able to say um, that hopefully someone will be held accountable is important. So sure thank you. Sure is. We are going to take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, so now we know 200 tips have been received and maybe even more now. There probably are more now, which I think is really great. I do wonder 
if Richard Allen acted alone, because the way that the crime happened and him on the bridge and all that, it is possible that he was a complete lone wolf. And sunset in that area around that time of year would be 6 p.m. ish. So if he at uh, 2.13 p.m. was seen walking towards them on the bridge, if they made it across the creek within, you know, a, a minutes, then that's like half past two. So I don't know exactly where he would have committed his horrendous crimes and fulfilled his fantasy. I wonder if it would have been in one of Ron Logan's hunting cabins, as, as people have uh, speculated, if he kept them there for a bit and fulfilled his fantasies and then killed them because it is such a small community. So Pat Brown, profiler Pat Brown, as she said, he would have had to, in his own mind, he would have had to kill them no matter what he was there to do because they would recognize him. He works at the CVS right there. He lives in Delphi. It's a tiny community. So so that that is true, but it seemed really like he's, this crime was very, very premeditated and calculated in my personal opinion. But let me know what you think, right? So I wonder if he had actually kept them somewhere, fulfilled his fantasies, and then murdered them and then staged the scene on Ron Logan's property? Was that an attempt to frame him or not? Was he dressed like Ron Logan on purpose or not? These are all questions we still have. Is there any connection to Ron Logan or not? But I would speculate that he probably left uh, the trail and the property and everything after sunset. Wouldn't you think? It would be so much easier for him to then have time to clean up wherever he cleaned up and probably... I don't know if he had like a a change of clothing anywhere or anything like that, or just to wait till the sun sets and then walk in the dark to wherever he parked his car. Who knows if he even, he probably didn't walk home like that in whatever state he was in, probably parked his car somewhere, or there's still the possibility that he got picked up by someone. But that whole theory, damn, I could just go in multiple directions and think this all through a hundred times, a hundred million times. How about you? You know, it's just like until we know, we actually really just don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if he acted alone as much as I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least one other person involved. What do you think? What is your personal opinion? Of course, we don't know until we know, <laughs> which is what Doug Carter always tells us. One day we'll know what they know. And we just have to be patient. And of course, the focus is on fighting for justice for Abby and Libby. That is the focus. Not to satisfy a morbid curiosity or find out exactly what he did. You know, some people in, in true crime, I've seen some people get really deep into the morbid curiosity of exactly what the bodies looked like, how they were found. Not so much what the guy did and what the fight for justice is. Some people get a little too curious about the corpses, you know. So let's not do that. We want to find out what happened so we can understand the whole case. But at the end of the day, this is a fight for justice for Abby and Libby. That is what our focus should be. So with that, we have to be patient. We have to know that this guy is going to trial and he's going to be held accountable for whatever it is he did, of which right now he's facing two counts of murder with the charges that we just looked at. So let's just wait for that and whether it is March or at a later date it could be at a later date they could shift it we'll see but either way I really hope we can all just be patient and know these things take time at the end of the day we want justice for the victims and I really hope that that man if he's the one who did it will never get out of prison again that's it from me for now of course there's so much still that i have for you i have mountains of information coming at me so thank you so much to all of you who are emailing me all sorts of interesting things that you're finding i really really appreciate it keep doing that grizzly true crime at gmail.com if you are curious about my other channel or ways to support me or things like that everything is on grizzly which is my website and if you are interested in picking up some merch to represent being part of this community that's all on grizzly so I will see you in the next one. Stay safe and let's be patient. And of course, I will keep you updated on everything that develops in this case and all the others that we are following and will be following. Thank you so much and I'll see you again soon.